It's September 19th, 2022. This is Rook. Well, hi there. Welcome to episode number 200 of Rook and a special edition of our program. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Good to be with you. And I really hope you are keeping well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, from Canada. Uh, Salam Dustan Aziz, Stuart Bashama. Uh, this week, we're about to do a show here that we did not intend to be recording. In fact, uh, we had a stellar lineup of guests planned for today. Um, the great lifestyle guru Mona Vand and the classical piano star Shaqaiqa Nosrati in Germany, a new, a new regular segment with a famous Iranian broadcaster, and we were going to do a, a celebration of this 200th show. And, um, well, we have postponed all of that for now because as a team, we really didn't feel like we could move ahead with a, a program that did not recognize and reflect what has been happening in Iran and for Iranians around the world for the last few days. Rest in peace, Massa Amini. So this is a special edition of Rook. In the next couple of hours, we're going to bring on voices from across the Iranian diaspora reacting to the death of an innocent young woman killed in detention in Tehran just a few days ago. Uh, we're going to go to journalist Mohammad Manzarpour in Washington, then broadcaster Maral Mohammadi in London in the UK, actress and model Mondana Karimi in Paris, cartoonist and activist Nikahan Kosar will join us from DC, fashion blogger and influencer Bahar Eslami is in Vancouver, she'll be with us, documentarian and researcher Dore Khatibi Hill is in Yorkshire, UK, she'll be with us. And finally, singer and dancer Saba Zameni in Toronto. And we are um, certainly grateful that all of these folks are taking the time to lend their voices to this moment. I'm joined by Smart Pega in the studio. Hello. Hello. And Groovy Shia. Hi. Hi, Azam. Hi. Pretty weird few days. Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we, we've actually been talking the last few days what can we possibly do what can we add to this conversation how can we do something given this the current situation which of course is blowing up in iran as we speak yes, yes. uh and um there's certainly a lot of anger and heartbreak around the world including mm -hmm. amongst our team um actually i've never seen this kind of um, solidarity among people mm -hmm. uh, it's really amazing people are certainly unified in their anger yeah that's for sure yes. yeah yes. Yeah. So if, if, let me do, a, if you've been entirely out of the loop, uh, let me stage, set the stage for what we are talking about. Um, many in the global Iranian community are once again mourning the loss of another one of our own, not to mention uh, the outcry and protests that are happening in the streets currently in Iran, as I say. A 22-year-old Iranian woman was pronounced dead last Friday after being detained by the Iranian Morality Police, also known as the Gashte Ershad. And for those who are unfamiliar, Gashte Ershad are currently the main agency tasked with enforcing Iran's Islamic code of conduct in, in public, which includes the hijab and dress code mandates. And these guys are empowered to impose fines and arrest members of the public and agents are often undercover and target popular destinations within cities across Iran. And the Gashde Ershad, or morality police, are believed to draw many of their personnel from the Basij, which of course is a hardline paramilitary unit. So what happened this time? Well, on Tuesday evening of last week, uh, a, a young woman named Massa Amini, 22 years old, along with her family, who had traveled to Tehran from Iran's Kurdistan region, simply as tourists, were stopped by a patrol of these morality police. Massa was singled out, uh, and it was here that Massa's brother, uh, Kiorash, mm -hmm. I think is Kiorash, made every effort possible to 
uh, intervene, but was ultimately told that his sister was being taken to the police station for an hour of what they call re-education, I mean, you know, presumably because her hijab or headscarf was not put on properly. Massa was then taken to a detention center, and uh, within hours of arriving there, Massa was transferred to a hospital with symptoms similar to a concussion, and shortly after, this totally seemingly healthy young woman was in a coma and declared brain dead. Then on Friday, news broke that she had died in in that hospital. And, and since then, Iranians inside Iran, as well as around the world, have been aghast protesting this latest and most horrendous atrocity. Now, I should say the greater Tehran police commander, a guy named Hossein Rahimi said a few hours ago, the incident was unfortunate. <laughs> That's his quote. Uh, and Iranian authorities are claiming she uh, she suddenly had a heart attack when she was in custody because 22-year-olds are prone to having sudden heart attacks when they are otherwise fit and healthy and have no, no history of heart problems, according to her dad. The whole situation is outrageous. It's infuriating, and it's uh, it's terribly sad. And... So um, we scrapped our planned lineup mm -hmm. and uh, thought about how, what we can do, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, what we can do, literally. <laughs> well, really? well, well, one thing, we can, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that, I mean, you know, uh, other than feel helpless, one thing we thought we could do is, uh, I mean, we're not really... This this program doesn't doesn't have a political agenda. Mm -hmm. We yes. we talk about being non political, non partisan. Uh, you know, we feel like we've got a real cultural imperative in terms of what we want to do, our our mission and the diaspora. Um, but you know, this is about basic human rights, and and we thought if we talk about this and and bring on voices in English. You know, there's a fair amount of conversation that's happening, yes. uh, certainly in social media yes. and in um, in Persian media uh, about this, uh, you know, Persian Twitter and stuff. But unfortunately, in English, um, other than some now some celebrity tweets and mm -hmm. yes. a couple of articles here and there, you know, in the BBC or whatever, there really it, it hasn't been you know anywhere near a global story yeah. uh, obviously there were some other things going on in the world and and but um but that's part of the heartbreak it's it is is uh you know the world was galvanized correctly we should think by the george floyd situation and you kind of think well what does it take mm -hmm. in iran uh for the the world to be galvanized you know as well so so we thought maybe doing something in english uh as our show is could be a, a panacea or a slight, a small, in our small way, a corrective to this. Um, uh, this is something that hopefully people can share. The voices we're bringing on are, yeah. are smart, they're, they're heartfelt. They've been talking about this in, in their own social media and in the, their own lives and their, their own industries. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I should start off by just, I would, Pega, what, what have you been feeling the last few days? I mean, like many others, it's just, like you said, hopelessness more than anything else. But the thing I was thinking about earlier today is, you know, it's almost become not shocking anymore to hear news like this come out of Iran, but at the same time, still equally shocking to see the horrific events that take place. And I don't know if that makes sense, but it's almost like there's so much of this that has happened that the pain never decreases, mm -hmm. but somehow it's like, if it were to happen in another place, I might be more surprised. And that's part of the tragedy is that, you know, we've almost become accustomed to hearing horrific news like this come out of Iran. And again, it doesn't take away from the pain, but that's it's just something I was thinking about earlier today and how awful that is. No. Yeah. I mean, uh, since you said ho hopelessness, I mean, by doing like, what are we doing right now? it also brings some hope again that we don't give up you know we yeah. we, mm -hmm. we have to fight 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 until we reach to the like freedom you know and by the way we're t we're a bunch of people talking on a podcast i mean there's a there's people in the streets yeah. uh, yes. bravely in tehran yes. doing the yeah. or or all over iran to a certain yeah. extent now and certainly in kurdistan uh, they're they're doing the the real work of yeah. of trying to 
create change. You know what, Shai, I was thinking that you, you grew up in Iran. Yeah. You were there until three or four years ago. Yeah. I, Pega, you spent a bunch of time there. I did. Um, sort of growing up there. Well, what's, what's I the was story? there until yeah. I was five, okay. and I've been back once after that. I think you're there until you're five counts as growing up there, but maybe maybe not as an, an adult. But, um, you know, for me, some of this stuff, uh, honestly, I feel like I'm – as you say, on the one hand, it's we're used to this kind of news, mm-hmm. um, like ho- horrible news uh, mm-hmm. coming from Iran. And when you're doing a, a show like this, you can't avoid it. We can't not discuss what happened with Flight 752 or something. So, so we're we're constantly involved in you know Aubon or horrible news that's yes. coming out, and and um, even when we don't have a political mandate. But at the same time, I I really feel like like I was thinking the last few days because obviously I was seeing a lot of people posting on social media and um, some of them posting really profound things some maybe not so much but I I was really thinking of I got to say something and I was thinking well what what can I add to this you know what what can I possibly I mean I I do believe that it's good for everyone to raise their hand and say Mm -hmm. we're we're aware of this we're unhappy with this and and lend their voice in that way and so i knew we were going to do something like this on our show but in terms of actually making some kind of statement or something what and and one of the stumbling blocks for me is i i really can't get my head around some of this stuff like as someone who grew up in the west and i'm not saying this isn't shocking or outrageous for people who grew up in iran or under this regime or who are in Iran right now obviously Mm -hmm. they're in the streets they're angry they're upset they're crying but uh, I just can't uh, you know I can't get my head around how outrageous this is Mm -hmm. how fucked up this is that you take a a, a woman who's doing nothing nothing you know is a tourist because of the way she's wearing her scarf, you take her and detain her, and then this woman, based on the treatment of her, ends up dying, is killed. A 22-year-old has been killed because of the way she was wearing her scarf. It, it, it doesn't compute. Like, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's hardly like, I'm the last person to say in the West we're growing up in some flowery democracy. Mm-hmm. But this idea is th- insane to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never I'll never understand how this pretense of of controlling people is possible. And so my mind immediately goes to like really I mean I feel like almost shameful places like I go well was she protesting? No. They say no. Well, was she did she, you know, attack one of these police officers or something and they were they're retaliating? I mean, it just the more you learn about it, the more insane it gets. Yeah. She didn't do anything. She didn't do anything. Where in the world are people being killed for doing nothing? Yeah. I mean, a lot of places in the world, but but th- but this is under the the rubric or the pretext of this is Islam and it is so foreign to me and it plays it's so counterintuitive like because I think you know you grow up in the West and whoever's in power wants to retain power that's not new Mm -hmm. and so (laughs) the objective is to try and keep the population liking you Mm -hmm. I mean You've already got a disastrous economy, you know? You've already got a hundred billion reasons, a water shortage, everything, a hundred reasons why people hate you in Iran. Why would you, it seems so counterintuitive to me that you wanna do something that is gonna turn the people against you. And clearly, this government, this regime in Iran doesn't give a shit. It's rule with an iron fist, scare the shit out of people, whatever, do whatever we need to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, it could also i mean it gives you like a very mm, very small picture that how 
fearful people live in Iran you know that it's happening every day we now we, we've heard about Mahsa Amini and uh, who was murdered but the, the fear is every day you know mm-hmm. every single day yeah uh, when you go out you have to be and uh, well if you can go out and not be doing anything and be rounded up and you know murdered I mean what yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, who you know who's safe but yeah. that's the control mechanism right is that that fear like you were talking about, you know, wanting to be liked and the norm of, you know, other governments and things like that. But I think the norm of this government is to control with that fear. Like Shia saying, you know, you, you walk out of your house and you're just instantly in fear of anything that could potentially happen. Right. Well, I mean, so we we talked amongst ourselves, how can we help or what can we do? What can we add to the conversation? And... um. We certainly got some great guests coming on. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there is a perfect way to do this, and 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 we can't. You know, there's no point in us trying to replicate or compete with the breaking news coverage that you know. Uh, I don't know some of the TV outlets and and Twitter folks can do. Um, but one thing is that I feel like certainly a lot of non Iranians, because of the dearth of media coverage and. Mm-hmm. Um, even some Iranians in the diaspora mm-hmm. uh, really don't know, you know, if you're second, third generation, if you're people like us, you know, mm-hmm. who didn't uh, heard a lot about this morality pro- police or, you know, what this regime does, and but but can't, you know, get our heads around the authoritarian mindset, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, we thought we would provide some kind of, try to provide some kind of primer uh, for those who are less familiar with this situation. So my apologies up front to people who have been reading about this voraciously and who are steeped in all of the details. You may find some of this um, to be um, um, you know, more elemental, um, but I'm also, I just want to ask people how they're feeling mm-hmm. and um, what they think this means and how they think something like this could happen. And, and from a couple of our more expert types, uh, you know, what what this is all about yeah. in Iran. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just, I wasn't actually going to bring this up because, you know, like you said, I feel I'm not equipped in any way to talk about a personal experience. But just because I feel like in light of, you know, everything that's happening, what I was saying about my one and only trip to Iran, I was there for 33 days. And in those thirty after you, after you were grew up there, yeah, yeah, I was I think sixteen or seventeen mm-hmm. when we went. I can't recall, but um, I was there for thirty three days. On the third or fourth day I was there, I was actually almost picked up by the morality police, mm-hmm. and it was only because of my uncle intervening. And you know, I don't know if he paid them off or bribed them or talked to them or whatever. But we left immediately from where we were, and it was thinking back on that now. I mean, I don't think I realized the scope of things while it was happening, especially because I got lucky and we left and nothing really happened. But, you know, in the context of something like this, you think about how extremely, you know, horrible that could have been, Mm -hmm. you know, what what could have happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, reading all of these posts and looking at Twitter and seeing these photos, you know, even as someone who only had a minor experience with something like that, it's it's awful. Yeah. Yeah. And I know Shia, um, it may not be because you were wearing your hijab the wrong way, but but you you or whatever you know the the excuses are for the the, the yeah. morality police used to round up women, but you you have experienced other versions of this. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, I mean I, I experienced like uh, when I was going out with, for example, my girlfriend, and they picked her. It 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 is scary, you know, that you have to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so try and talk your way out. Yeah, of it. and then you you get traumatized and you don't go out. You know, simply you you, you prefer to stay home and yeah. All right. And to be on the other end of that too, like you know, we're I keep thinking of this as you know the women who are targeted. But just even hearing Shia say that and referring back to my experience of you know my uncle being there, like what you experience is just as equally awful. Yeah, and they beat you and they it it's. Yeah, they're uh, sorry. They're animals. Sorry, I, I, sorry for my language. Um, uh, please never use the word animals. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's terrible language. Fuck. 
<laughs> no, poor animals. You know, they, uh, yeah, right, no. sorry, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> um, okay, let's go. Let's go to all of our guests. Uh, uh, they start to walk through the world here with these um, folks who are waiting uh, to to speak. And uh, I'll come back to you guys on the other end of it. All right. So let's start with. Um, uh, we're going to go to Washington D.C. and um, to start this primer, uh, Mohammed Manzarpour. Uh, he's the general manager of Persis Media and a contributing editor for Rook. He joins me right now from Washington, D.C. Hello, Mohammed. Hello, Gian. Thanks for coming back on the program uh, in this difficult situation. And I also understand that you're currently down with COVID. You doing okay? Uh, yes, it's my second day. Uh, I have a little bit of shortness of breath, but I'm happy to w be with you on this very important subject. Yeah, you're a trooper. Thanks for doing this. So, uh First and foremost, I mean, we've we've had you on the program before, and you've um, you've been through a lot yourself personally uh, through Ir in Iran when you were there uh, dealing with this regime. What what was your personal reaction when you heard the news last week? First of all, that this um, young woman had been uh, detained and then um, was in a coma, and then that uh, Massa Amini had in fact died. Well, naturally, I think anyone who is, uh, you know, who has any element of humanity in them would feel deep sorrow and anger towards what's happened to Mahsa. This was a very young lady who came to the capital for uh, for an excursion with her with her brother, and uh, you know, from the videos released by by the police itself in Iran. Uh, her dress, her you know, her appearance was even above and beyond the standard of what is called acceptable hijab in Iran. But yet she was targeted by by the so-called morality. I call them the immorality police. Right. And uh, she died within a matter of two hours from detention. So. Um, I, I feel a lot of resentment and hate and anger and, you know, something which sticks in your throat and you don't know what to do with it, basically. I think many Iranians feel the same. You know, as I was saying in the introduction of this um, little special that we've created, I, um, you know, we can't compete with folks who are 24-7 um, uh, digesting the news on social media and Persian, etc. But for those listening around the world who um, have one foot in Iran, one foot in other news, etc., and are wondering what the hell is going on, um, I want to try and provide some kind of a primer on some of this stuff, which you can be helpful with. Uh, first of all, what is the morality police or who are the morality police? Well, basically, this morality police or Gash the Ershad, so-called, uh, is the latest incarnation of a series of uh, organizations or uh, thugs being organized in, across the country since the early days of the revolution to primarily suppress uh, the younger people in society and especially women. Uh, initially at the early stages of the revolution, they were called the Comité. Uh, they were basically like, um, um, for all intents and purposes, people who were um, thugs in neighborhoods who would wear this green uniform and stand on street corners and harass you know, anyone who uh, who they deemed not to be, you know, Islamic enough or right. uh, covered enough. And then that has evolved into all sorts of different organizations. And this is the latest incarnation. So many uh, young people in Iran have suffered at the hands of these, you know, networks. According to one statistics, uh, just in one year, they have summoned more than 165,000 Iranian women to um, the Islamic court right. in Tehran for not observing the hijab. So it's it's just a curse upon the nation. And it's, 
I mean, again, as I mentioned in the intro to the show, as somebody who grew up in the West, some of this stuff is almost, it's so hard to get my fucking head around. I mean, it's just, it, you know, morality police. I mean, first of all, you know, it, it's, what nonsense, right? Um, and and, and what, what does this have to do with Islam? And what, what are you even talking about? But um, it becomes something that people are, are kind of... Um, you know, I don't want to say it becomes normalized, but people get used to it as a as a matter of um, they, there's no 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 choice. Certainly, if you're growing up in Iran, and and after a while, this becomes part of your sad of the difficult reality there. But also, they seem to be operating by no particular rules, or the rules are sometimes misapplied or inconsistently applied. Like there's no rhyme or reason of who gets picked up or who doesn't. Right? From what? I've gathered from, you know, reports coming out of Iran, apparently they have a quota they have to meet. Like uh, every team has to arrest a number of people, a certain number. And uh, they're in it for the money and, you know, whatever privileges they receive. So they pick on anyone they can lay their hand on. There isn't a specific criteria that you have to meet to be harassed. Um, it's it's just a matter of being at the wrong place at the wrong time and, you know, falling into uh, the net of these, you know, thugs uh, who are usually from far-fetched uh, kind of, uh, I would say, uh, remote villages who've been organized into, you know, these uh, these mobs who hate modernity and hate any any young person who is enjoying their you know their youth or but, but what but what's the real point time. what's the real point of these thugs i mean surely it's not uh, the 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 fear of a strand of a woman's hair i mean the, the is is the point to is it like to remind everyone big big brother is watching you know you better toe, toe the line or absolutely. we're going to absolutely i mean the the thing about totalitarian regimes especially theocratic totalitarian regimes is that they want to they want to establish themselves in every aspect of every citizen's life so from what you wear to what you eat to your sex life what you do in in bed is determined by the state uh, and that is the main primary purpose of these, uh, you know, mobs. They're there to say, we have the right to infringe on your every aspect of, you know, civil liberties. Mm. That's the main purpose. You know, you've been a journalist for decades and, and you cover this stuff uh, for uh, major broadcasters and independently uh, day after day you've seen a lot of things that make Iranians both in Iran and around the world angry this this seems like um, one of those moments that's much bigger than the reaction we we normally see to atrocities or difficult news coming out of Iran why do you believe Massa's death in detention not the first in Iran probably not the last has caused such an outcry I think because it could be kind of compared to the last straw which broke the camel's back, Iranians, uh, Iranians in general, are are suffering, uh, you know, from um, rampant inflation, from um, uh, all sorts of uh, social, um, you know, kind of crises. There, there is a water shortage crisis in major parts of the country there is mismanagement of the health health care service there is you know constant uh, repression and oppression of the people so um, hope is running out rapidly in iran uh, there were there were those who were hopeful that there could be a second round of uh, negotiations or a nuclear deal with the west and now that seems to be out of the window. Um, you know, the cost of living in Iran is is astro astronomical now. Mm. So I think uh, Massa's tragic uh, death has come at a time when um, when a perfect storm is brewing in the country. Mm. 
so it has provided a uh, a reason for me for people to uh, to basically rise up and you know to voice their uh, their anger and their um, frustration, I think. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of people correctly wondering why this situation um, shouldn't become, uh, why her name shouldn't become a global name the way George Floyd's name became a, uh, you, you know, a global concern. Um, I, I would say this this situation is almost... <laughs> You think that there's nothing worse than George George Floyd, but I mean, in this case, I mean, there's uh, there's no evidence there was even any resistance on her part, right? I mean, it's just a, a, a you know just killing somebody um, based on your crazy rules. Um, do do you think? I mean, I guess the million dollar question, and I almost fear asking this as I'm asking all the guests this today, but because it it it's something that we say every time, somewhat with hope, somewhat with with concern. But it, you know, um, do you think this is a tipping point for the situation in Iran? I mean, I mean, do you believe that this could lead to change in a way that so many things that have outraged and saddened us around the, the world uh, in Iran in the last 43 years uh, have not led to? It's very difficult to forecast what's in store for Iran, but what I can say is that uh, Massa's death will probably be remembered as the tipping point of the time when fear transcended the public to the regime. Mm. I think this is what's happening. I mean, I've seen videos now coming out of, you know, parts of Iran, some very remote, where people are um, are basically forcing a very armed, uh, you know, units of Iranian security services uh, into retreat. And we've we've barely seen that happening ever, and not just that, but the language. I mean, uh, the the kind of um, the freedom or the bravery that protesters are expressing. I remember having you on this program when we were doing the contemporary history of Iran episode on the student rights, student protests of of nineteen ninety nine, which you were part of, and you got detained and put in prison and all of that. Um, and you were talking about how that was at the forefront. That was one of the first times you heard something like death to the dictator. That's commonplace now. I mean, people are in it the streets is. saying that in Tehran today, right? Uh, they're saying much, I mean, far worse than death to the dictator. I mean, I've been, uh, I've been listening to slogans like Khamenei qatile velayatish qatile, which means Khamenei is a murderer and his... Uh, his jurisprudence is uh, is basically void, and you see p- uh, students in Tehran University chanting, um, you know, anti-clergy slogans in front of clergy, mm. uh, in in front of you know clerical people within the university, and uh, I've and, never seen this before. And what do we learn from that? As I said, I think it's a it's a transformational stage for the Iranian resistance against the regime, where you can definitely see that the element of fear is is moving out of the public, the, the, the you know the protesters, and you see it uh, basically transferring to to elements of of the regime mm. in the streets, and I think this would eventually. Uh, make the make the difference. A final question to you that I will be asking people too. Uh, um, how do you feel about? I mean, this is. I think this is the first time uh, in a long time. I mean, maybe we saw some of this stuff around Flight Seven Five Two, but this is the first time I can remember where major Western names and celebrities and. Uh, influential types are speaking out, are are lending their voice to, hey, we should pay attention to what's happening here with this this woman who's been killed. Um, uh, what do you make of that? Is that a cause for optimism that the the world is waking up somehow to uh, the plight of Iranians? I still think, unfortunately, it's. Um, um, 
far fewer than what we expect uh, from the international community. I mean, Massa's death has received little or no coverage in major uh, news broadcasters, especially in North America, like CNN, Fox News, uh, you know, very, 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 very little coverage. So far. I mean, so uh, far. Yeah, yeah, depending on and, how the protests go, et cetera. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think this is outrageous. Mm. This is totally outrageous. I think there's a deliberate effort by, uh, by some news organizations not to mention Iran at all. For whatever reason, I, I I don't see I don't even know the reason, and I can't imagine the reason. Mm. But what I see is the amount of atrocities which are happening in Iran, which is which are not you know uh, raising any eyebrows in any parts of the world. This is this is uh, this is shameful in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, you're you're not wrong, uh, Mohammed Manzarpour, uh, as ever. Thank you, sir. Take care of yourself. Get better. Thank you. That's Mohammed Mazarpour, General Manager of Persis Media, a contributing editor for Rook. He joined us from Washington, D.C. today. Now to get a perspective from someone currently in the UK, but all too familiar with Iranian cultural issues, Maral Mohammadi is an Iranian British TV presenter, producer, and senior multimedia journalist at the Iran International Network in London. She was born and raised in Tehran. She is the host of the very fine cultural program Panjere. And right now, Maral Mohammadi joins me from London, England. Hello, Maral. Hi, Jian John. How are you? I'm okay. Thanks for coming on today to talk about this uh, this incredible moment, uh, difficult moment, but um, also very powerful moment that's happening uh, in Iran and with Iranians around the world. What was your? I've seen you posting about this. What was your personal reaction when you heard the news that young Massa Amini had, in fact, died in detention? Vivian, I think I don't. I don't think my reaction or feeling was any different to other people. I think it was. I, I was first. I was shocked. Then came the anger. Then came the sadness. Um, and then it kind of built built up on that. Yeah. Um, and on the first day, and I kept imagining her brother, and and how he must be feeling because she was walking with him and he's the last person who who was with her and and the family and everybody who know knows her and then random like uh, uh, just being caught by surprise I would I keep finding myself in tears without even realizing that I'm crying mm. like it was it, it kind of taken over every other thing that was happening in my head um but but it all like all all the emotions that I had kind of um, came down to anger and 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 shock yeah. uh, anger and sadness um, not shocked really because it it, it is it, it, they they keep doing this mm. in different forms we we keep hearing sadly we keep hearing events like this occurring and. And we still get shocked because it is a life of a human being that was just lost for no reason. Like it, it's it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, but it is the, the the sorrow, it's the sadness and and, and rage um, together. I think that which I think everybody yeah. is like anybody that I speak with inside and outside of Iran. They they all have this anger. Um, how can you partly, not? How can you not how be? How can outraged? you not? Yeah. Exactly. And it, it feels and, so. It feels so good versus evil. I mean, it, it, there's yeah. no. There's no nuance to this. I mean, you. You know, killing an innocent young person for what? Right. Exactly for what? 
for what? Like, it, not that all the other ones are justified, and you, but mm. but they they all start with something and then escalates very quickly, and then they're dead. They they kill people in protests, or they 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 kill them in prisons, or or I don't know. It, but this was just like she was just walking in the street, right? And, and and a tourist. She's not some fancy North Tehran. Yeah, I mean she's a, she's not even from Tehran, right? So she's she's yeah. traveled to I mean South, the whole story yeah. is is outrageous and and tragic. Uh, you know, uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times now that you know uh, that growing up in the West, I mean I I still have trouble getting my head around something like morality police. Like what, what you know how, how yeah. what, what does that even mean for those who have grown up even the, the people on the rook team you know who grew up in iran especially the women they, they're they are all too familiar you know with uh and and i think maybe that's why it hits home so much for for folks who, who are saying you know this could have been me this could have been anyone do, do you have an experience a personal experience with the the so-called morality police uh, does it does it trigger you in the same way it, it, i don't think it triggers me like a lot of other people because for some unknown reason i've i've been lucky enough to not ever been taken uh, in a car for like a, as morality police mm. um, as in like for for what i was wearing or what i looked like um but I have been in a few, like my mom got into fights with them whenever we saw uh, people being taken uh, by them. And one of the times that I remember very clearly, she came to pick me up from school. I was like a, in high school, so like 15, 16. So in, in the uniform that already, like even if you're the most beautiful person on earth, it just makes you look like... It, it, it's very, um, um, what's the word, uh, unflattering. Mm. Um, um, and I was tired and already, you know, I, I, I was not, I did not look like anything that the morality police would, mm -hmm. would come and say, what, why are you wearing this? And we're walking in, um, in the Passage Van Eyck, which is where my grandma's house was. And um, the morality police stopped this couple, this young girl and boy, um, and they were taking them. And my mom just kind of threw herself in, in the whole uh, thing that was happening and managed to get the boy out because back then they, they, would, they really hit boys really hard. They were physically not that aggressive with, with girls, but guys were, were getting beaten up very easily. So we managed to get the guy out of the, the two big... Um, filthy men that were taking them and um sorry what were they taking them for they they were just like what they were what, who who is this person to you did these the, oh. um uh, why are you wearing this like right. what was your manteau short was your hair showing like why why did they take them for not really a reason um and then my mom started gurbun sadaqe raftan of these two um uh, the, the the officers Thugs, so yeah. bera, let them go it's like my son it's like why do you take them you are like my son like she she kind of treated them like human beings and she was so nice to them and i was so grossed out by this that how can you say these things mm. to the to these people and then the guy said hanum john is this your daughter is this is this what she's wearing of course you you know it's your pro your your fault that she's like this you should come with us so she was like no no that's my daughter and i was standing there like wearing a sack we managed to get the uh, both both a girl and a boy out from um their claws and everyone was standing back just watching hmm. And when they left, everyone was was applauding my mom. I was like, oh, well done. It was so brave of you. And my mom then started fighting with them that if you've all come forward, we would have been able to save them right. a lot easier. And it would have not gotten got into, you know, a, a physical like pulling and pushing. Um, but 
luckily I was never. I don't even know why. And Although how, it's it's scary but, to come forward, right? I mean, I yes. this this is something that folks are are dealing with right now. I've spoken to a couple of people I know in Iran of, of whether they want to even go on the streets or or join the protests because, and it's incredibly brave those who are doing the protesting because. You don't know um, who's going to get picked up, what's going to happen to them if they get picked up. And this system of um, indoctrinated fear is, um, which is, of course, the hallmark of authoritarian regimes, we're always told, it seems to be exactly what the morality police idea is about, right? Just just scaring yeah. the shit out of everybody so that yes. you can control them. And, and, and it is now, I mean, until now, people would think that if I go forward to to stop them from taking someone, they might also take me as well. But now it is the fear that they might kill me because right. they took this this young woman for what she was wearing and her corpse came out of, of their building. Um, so anybody going out, anybody doing anything to stop them taking um, people it, do a very, very brave thing. It is, it is, it's not something that I can tell people that, oh, you know, next time you see someone, you have to go and stop them. It is a scary thing. And anybody who does it, I, I applaud them standing. Um, but that's the only thing that I feel you can do because if you don't, it's very, very likely that the next person that they kill could be you. Like it's, it, it's not, yeah. it's not, it's not like when they kill you in, in a situation like this, you can keep telling yourself that, oh no, I don't do anything political. I stay quiet. I don't do any protest. I don't post anything political. I try to stay in my lane mm. and safe. So nothing will happen to me but you do go outside you do walk in the streets right. and now they might this might happen to you, you know, just it's, walking down the street is a liability i mean it, but, exactly. but but if if the intention of the regime is to quell dissent it certainly isn't working this time um why do you believe Massa's death in detention again not 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 the first in Iran probably not the last why is this causing such an outcry why is this affecting the world so powerfully I think for this exact reason that she was not she was doing nothing it wasn't she wasn't even walking next to a protest she just she was a tourist in a city and what she's wearing, not that I think if she was wearing something revealing, this would have been justified. Right. But they didn't even have to, based on their rules, she wasn't doing anything wrong either. She's wearing this long black thing over her clothes, black shawl, but like even to their books, based on their, their rules, she wasn't doing anything wrong. Mm. She wasn't wearing anything that required them to, that, that would make them want to take her away. So this makes people feel like nobody is safe. There's nothing you can do that can keep you safe. This could, like everybody who, who've heard this story have thought that this really could have been me or my mm. sister. When you see all the the outcry in social media when you when you see the protests that are happening right now inside Iran. Um, what what do you think? Do you feel like this is some kind of inflection point? If anybody that I've spoken with inside Iran and all the videos that I've seen and all the interviews that people has done uh, have done on on news channels, it does feel a bit different. It feels like. I don't I don't know what might come from this but it does feel like one of the things that will remember like yeah. we will always remember Aban we will always remember the flight this is one of those ones we'll always remember Navid there, there are certain but these are not the only pe not not that all the other ones right. were less right. important right. Right. but they 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 
I don't know, each of them have a specific thing about them that makes them like like a um, um, something point. What do you call, what's the word? Um, a tipping point or, or a, uh, a thing, yes, yeah. yes. Um, I don't know what might come from it. Who knows? Maybe because they they actually want to like something might happen to hijab to to a uh, um, compulsory hijab. I, I don't know what will come from this, but I do think I, I do feel like it is different to the 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 some of the other ones. It is it is the whole thing is so tragic yeah. for so many different yeah. reasons. Yeah, uh, it's it's weird being in the the diaspora too because you know there's still an element to this. There's still a little part of me that thinks. Um, I, you know, I I hate uh, the idea that Western people see something like this and and think this oh this is the way Iranians are they kill uh, you know uh, uh, be, um, but it really feels like something that needs to be that needs to move beyond the global Iranian community that needs to be but so you, you think know. that it isn't you think this is not what's happening I mean it. It, it it is true. What, it is happening. What, what like what's it, happening? As in as in you know us being worried that the West sees Iranians being treated like this. No no no. I'm not worried about the. the I want them to see. I'm I'm exactly. I, I'm always defensive about somebody in the West thinking this is some something in our DNA. You know, uh, as opposed to a regime that most Iranians around the world. Uh, w want to get rid of, you know, uh, so it's, it's that double edged sword of one of hearing things uh, and, and going, oh, you know, you you having a sort of a racist view of Iran that, oh, this is what the, these are, this is the way these people are, you know, um, that's the thing that I get defensive about. I, and yet, how can we hide this from the world? You know, I mean, this is like this, this needs to be talked about. Yeah. But, and the thing is, one good thing that I feel like um, I hear and see amongst the people that I live, like the, the, the Westerners that I encounter or speak to about things like this, is that it is a bit more clear now that the, the message has been out that the government and the people are not, not exactly synonymous. the yeah. same. Yeah. And, and this helps. This helps that, um, I mean, some people are going to think what you said, regardless they, but the, but that's there's nothing you can do about a lot of the you know some some people who think right, like right. that and and um generalize the whole nation um but it is more clear thanks to i don't know social media that these videos come out or whatever um that the government and how the government treats people is not necessarily this government is not from this people and that I think it is it is a great thing that um, makes it a lot easier for me to show this to to my non Iranian friends mm. for for them to realize and and enrage them about the fact that the governments here are still dealing mm. with that government. Mm. It, it 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 doesn't make them see those people differently. If anything, it it kind of paints a picture mm. uh, like the, the pa paint the pa people um as fighters as people who don't give up as right. people who don't right. take uh um, um whatever the people in power tell them let me ask you a final question you, you you're you're not just the host of panjere that you, you this this great uh, cultural program you produ you're a producer you're you're someone who I would assume is in on the the booking and the idea of wh who who you're going to cover. Um, you know, it was very clear to us in the last few days that we, we can't just go on with our regular show when when the, there's a moment like this happening. H how do you approach it when you're doing a cultural show? It's very difficult. Like I'm I'm um, launching the new season this week, so we're working on the promo. We've, we've got we've planned this for like months who I'm going to have on the first day. But now I'm editing this show and I'm like, what, what, what is the point of me saying, oh, 
Yeah, Jean-Luc Godard died. Let's mm. see who he was. Let's yeah. look at it. It's like what it, it feels so wrong mm. um, to talk about that or or th this book that came out and this music video that we're gonna look. It I feel it feels so pointless mm. and wrong and disrespectful at times. And we have and I cannot, you know. But so but but usually when things like this happen, I start the show talking about this you cannot ignore this but at the same time my show is meant to be something that when like people take a bit of a breath from yeah. hard news when they watch this yeah. i can't focus on it too much but i usually start by talking about that and and by looking at how artists have reacted to um this the, the the latest tragedy that yeah, we're all living yeah. um but it does feel weird and wrong editing myself walking in the nature and then and then on the phone like on my phone on, next to me like the all the videos uh, are playing it, it is it's, I mean, you're doing your job. It's not I'm you, doing you my should job you shouldn't at the feel same guilty, time. but I understand exactly what. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it is guilt. Sometimes I just find it pointless mm. and 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 useless, like talking about art and culture when we're living through something like this. Yeah, I hear you, uh, Moral Mohammed Yi. It's a, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for doing this today. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, Aziza. Okay, bye-bye. Maral Mahamadi, uh, the broadcaster, uh, TV presenter, producer, a multimedia journalist at the Iran International Network in London. She, in fact, joined us from London, England today. The breath of the morning I keep forgetting The smell of the warm summer air. I live in a town can't smell a thing You watch your feet For cracks in the pain All right, let's go to Paris next. This is a Rook special focusing on the death of Massa Amini and uh, the fallacy of the morality police. Mondona Kadimi is an Iranian actress, model, and Bollywood star and humanitarian, regularly based in Mumbai, India. She was born and raised in Tehran in a conservative Muslim family. In her late teens, Mandana left Iran and soon became an internationally sought-after model. She starred in numerous feature films and TV programs in India, and she's also quite an entrepreneur. Right now, Mandana Karimi joins me from Paris, France today. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to see you and have you back on the program, albeit um, under difficult circumstances, what, what we're talking about here. You know, I've been asking everybody, Mondana, uh, how they felt or what their reaction was when they saw and heard what happened to Massa Amini. But I don't really need to ask you because I watched your story in which you um, you were in tears. Tell, tell me why this has so affected you. Um, you know, sometimes... Not, not sometimes, always, you know, I think that when, uh, you know, I left Iran and my life is going to be great and I'm not going to get bothered by things that are happening, not my problem, you know, I left the country and, you know, it's not going to affect me anymore. But every single time, every single time when I hear about someone getting arrested, someone getting beaten up, someone is dead, someone has been shot and, you know, it's it, it feels like, it's, it doesn't matter where I go. I'm in Paris, I'm in India, I'm traveling, but still, you know, there is this heavy weight of being Iranian follows me everywhere, you know? Mm. It's, um, I might not be in Iran anymore. I might not be, uh, you know, in the same pain that people are in, but I, I know how it feels because I remember myself when I was in Iran, I got arrested not once not twice not three times many times i used to live in a fear of um if i'm going out you know something is going to happen what should i wear where should i go um is this friend safe to hang out with or is this friend um you know 
safe to kind of open up and be vulnerable and have friendships and relationships. I know the fear. I know how it feels to to stay in a place where you don't have any freedom and it doesn't matter you are a woman or you are a man um and obviously for women it's just a little bit more um i don't know <laughs> crazy or more unbearable mm. to stay in a country like iran um but yeah so when i when i saw the pictures um about this girl has been arrested and she's in hospital and you know i i i saw crying first um because it's i it, it felt like it could be me in a hospital and it just i had this flashback of when in shomal we got arrested and um i remember i i was injured when they arrested us and um what did you know, they arrest they, you for what was it <laughs> funny the, they arrested us because uh my friends they took me to hospital and everyone was just making joke and you know they were having fun and because i i was riding a bike a bike on a beach and i got you know into the accident and uh, apparently someone from the hospital or some maybe you know police shakhsi they followed us and they were like okay who are these girls and boys and uh, the next thing we you know they just kicked the doors they came in they arrested us and um you know and and it, it, it it's a it's a long story that i want to explain it mm. but it's it's more of like the fact that i was in someone's house who i thought they were safe because they were their parents were part of government and we thought you know it's safe to be in their right, house right, right. if their boyfriend girlfriends or you know whoever was in that house but unfortunately those people who arrested us they wanted to make example of that family that you know um your blood is not red more red than anyone else mm. and uh so at any anyhow even by being the the place that we came from and the people that we were i remember um they throw us like a gusband you know throw us into the van and uh we were in this car and uh there was this uh woman who was uh pushing my friends and when i you know when i start saying things like oh why you are behaving you know we are coming with you we, we didn't say no we are coming with you but stop stop the punches stop the pulling the stop the pushing and um you know it's um yeah it's i, I don't know I, i don't know how to explain it i don't know how to put it in words mm. it's you i i left the country i'm not there anymore but uh, to be honest jian sometimes i feel like if i'm drinking with my friends at the bar or at my house and especially days like now i feel like someone is going to open the door and just i i'm going to get arrested mm. and maybe get getting beaten up and you know we we all got lashes in, in the la- last time last time when i got arrested in iran and that was that was one of the main reason i left the country because um without having money without knowing the language without my family support i i i fucking left the country because I mean I thought I'm going to be like probably get raped in one of those jails or die or I I don't know what could have happened to me I, I would be the place that um my my family would in the place of Maso's family or all the right. the many girls that we know probably I would be dead or I would be somewhere where I, I don't know I don't know where would have land if I stayed in Iran and that's that's why when I hear stories like this. I see the news. You know, I start getting really worried. And you know, my my, I, I've been in I, I I've been in Paris for a few days, and it's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful city, and uh, I feel anxious, and I feel like something is going to happen to me because wow. it yeah. feels like my past, whatever has happened to me, is kind of haunting me back. So. Right. How do you? How do you? I've been talking about this as somebody who grew up in the West. Who's, it it, it yeah. defies logic for me. How do you get your head around the notion that um, a, a, a girl who is visiting Tehran, you know, she's just out with her family uh, as a tourist, um, gets picked up because she's wearing a scarf the wrong way uh, yeah. and ends up dead in a detention center? Uh, I mean, how do you even? 
and, and all of this in the name of Islam, right? Um, you know, given your background and the family you grew up in, I mean, how, how do you even make sense of that? I can't, Gian. I can't make sense of that. And that's why it brings so much anger into me. I can't make any sense in any language, any religion, in the name of Allah, in the name of Jesus, in the name of uh, a holy cow in India, in the name of any God, you know. It's it's not right. I mean, I can't put any sense to it, Gian. Mm-hmm. I can't. It's. I, I mean, how can you even put a sense to what what they're doing? You know, I, I don't. I don't care about the whole fact of you know what government is doing and what's our situation in the country. And we are such a young country, and we have so many problems. I, you know, and life is so difficult, and I can't even understand why someone's scarf someone who has come to the city and to visit her family and suddenly her scarf was I don't know probably you could see a lot of a lot of her hair and how that's bothering anyone mm. you know forget forget the Iranians it's like tomorrow I'm gonna I don't know not like some wine and the guy in a restaurant is gonna just murder me because I didn't like the wine I mean you can't. You can't put any sense to it. Why, why do you think this, I mean, as you've said, these kind of atrocities are not new uh, in Iran, uh, yeah. and you've lived it. Um, why do you think this event uh, yeah. has affected people so much? Why do you think this event is capturing the attention of celebrities around the world and, and has lit up social media in the way it has? I think, Gian, is not this incident we've as iranians you know people who are living in iran and who are like outside of iran we've gone through so much it's like that level of you had it enough you know there is like a small little thing and then another situation another situation another situation another situation and it reached a point that people are like dude just just let us be Mm. i want to breathe throwing my hair in air where in what world you're living that is going to be a crime that i'm going to you know affect your politics and affect your islam and affect all the bullshit that you're believing in people had it enough you know a few months ago uh, a year a year and a half ago was the air day right a lot of people they lost their family a lot of people lost their families to the Aban situation and a lot of families they've lost their um you know children by just they were walking outside mm-hmm. and you know someone didn't like the way they look or the way they were wearing the hijab or scarf and you know they died and they got shot and people had it enough and i think you know the reason massa situation is so important because you know it's it's kind of for me at least you know it, it just says that enough is enough how many massa we have to lose how many right. massas have to Lose it. She was 23 years old. I mean, 22 actually. Yes. She, she just started her life. Probably. She she wanted you know from the pictures that I've seen, she looks so uh, young. I mean, she is so young. She lost her life for what? For a scarf? Yes. If if someone is a criminal, please murder them, kill them. But you walking around and killing teenagers. You, you're killing the, the youth of the country. If you don't have the youth, then what? So so technically, you don't bloody care about the youth. You don't bloody care about the people. You're just walking around and murdering the youth of your uh, country. And I think Massa's, you know, incident um, has made a lot of people and men realize that, listen, it's enough is enough. We had it. And Thank, thank God, you know, for the existence of social media and, you know, few channels from Iran where they're carrying all these news and the pictures comes out. Probably, Jian, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, maybe there were more, like, thousands of mass That's a good point. But we didn't know. Yeah, yeah. But we didn't know. The power of social media, the power of the fact that someone is doing something wrong and someone takes the phone out and films those motherfuckers who are murdering people... 15 years ago, we didn't know that many. But luckily, there are massas. And that's why 
people like Masa who have lost their life. I think they are so important, and we shouldn't we shouldn't let their blood to go for for no 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 cause. And people have to remember these people's name and Masas and the thousand Masas who have been gone. And it and it's I I don't know I I have a feeling that you know sometimes you know there are small small little little situations and little incidents you know i'm not saying that masa's situation or incident was small but i think it's a big part of a huge huge cause which has to happen because how 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 can anyone live in that country anymore i can't i'm not even in that country i can't for past three days i've been miserable i'm talking to friends and family in iran and everyone is miserable and it's not about I don't know. It's not about the money anymore. It's not about how expensive that country is. It's not about how uh, we don't have jobs. The COVID situation it destroyed so many lives because the government cannot handle anything. And on top of everything, on top of the tough life that we have, they're going around and murdering kids just because you're not wearing your scarf. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And I and I think it's a. Uh, it's a beginning of something bigger happening in in our country. Mondana, carry me. Um, I always appreciate you coming on. It's really, uh, uh, I appreciate seeing you. I appreciate your words. Thank you for taking the time. I know it's late in Paris. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jan, for having me, and it was lovely talking to you. Bye bye. Sorry, I um, I was really angry. <laughs> no, no, it's your. It, I hope you mind my words. No, thank you. Thank you for yeah. your. your, your letting your feelings go appreciate it bye bye thank you so much yeah bye bye paranoia is in bloom the pia a transmission is a will resume i'll try to push try to keep us all down down and hope that we will never see the truth around another promise another scene another a package like the This is a Rook special. My next guest is a distinguished Iranian-Canadian cartoonist, journalist, and blogger. And many people will recognize Nikohanko Sar for his regular presence on BBC Persian, Iran International, Radio Faradon, and a lot of other networks. Nico Hang also runs a website called AbanganIran.org, which specializes in covering Iran's water crisis. And right now, Nico Hang Kosar joins me from Washington, D.C. Hello, sir. Hi, Gian. Nice to have you back on the program. Difficult circumstances. I, I've been following you on Twitter and in social media. You've been posting a lot about uh, the, the, in your feed about the protests that are growing inside Iran as a reaction to this horrific death of Masa Amini. Does, does this feel different, Nico Hang, this time in terms of the, the tenacity and tenor of these protests and the regime's reaction? Is this some kind of inflection point? Uh, first of all, I think um, that it's a very sad situation to see uh, somebody that age-wise could be my own child had to face those sad experiences and lost her life. So for me and my generation, it's a very, very sad point. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, not that I'm saying that I was waiting for this to happen. No, I never want something like this to happen. But when you have a disastrous governance and people have lost so many things, through the years, they reach a point that they have nothing else to lose. Now we could see that in rural areas, in places where millions of people had lost their livelihood because of bad water management, bad economy, and had to migrate to slums, to city margins. But this time, it's the decency that's actually being harassed and uh, being attacked by the system. And many people from different walks of life who didn't feel to support the 
people in the past are now on the streets. What do you this mean? Is, what, what do you mean by that? It's a decency well, that's being attacked. Look, uh, Massa had had not done anything right. to deserve even a slap on the wrist. Right. And she was murdered by this system. For what reason? Practicing her rights? She was, she was a lively girl. She wanted to breathe. She wanted to possibly raise a family one day. And now people are seeing their own, the future of their own children mm. in what happened to her. And they cannot stand this. this. This situation has been, uh, we've had this situation in many parts of the country, but we had not heard of, let's say, instances where somebody was murdered in prison or being tortured like this and heading to the hospital. There have been many, many cases like this, mm -hmm. but this time, it was, uh, you could see the awareness in the society about what had happened over here. It's something like the moment of the uh, Arab Spring in Tunisia. Mm. I compare it to that situation right now. Well, and if that's the comparison, then it is an inflection point in your view. I think it is. And, uh, and I think the people who have nothing to lose will continue standing in front of this regime i'm not sure if it's going to bring down the regime or not but i can feel it that this is not going to stop although you could have phases of let's say cooling up cooling down for a while or even um, after a small attack on people in different parts of the country some would try to think twice but going forward because of all the crisis we have all around the country water food economy and now hijab this is going to continue let me, let me, Nico, let me ask you what i asked one of our previous guests uh today which is uh, what, what do you really think i mean at this stage uh the morality police you know what what is this really about it's some way to it's I can say in an Orwellian world, like we, we've experienced in Iran, it's a way to um, impose control on the society. It's, it's a way to uh, control the outcome by, by all means. Uh, that you would not dare actually stepping your foot across any not only red lines, but lines of other colors and other widths. Right. So it's it's a way to enforce the system on your day to day life. And many of us have ha have had bad experiences with these moral these officers. Would it be having a video tape in your bag and they would just pull it out and then take you to the police station, arrest you for two days? for having something immoral, like what, like I had a, I think a, um, a Martin Scorsese movie in my bag in 1980. I think it was the Goodfellas. Mm. I think it was Goodfellas. And I had to actually pay bribe to one of these officers to get out of the police station. And there have been many instances, you couldn't go to a party, you couldn't uh, be with your friend, and where did that, um, what so-called morality take us? You have a society that people do not trust the system. And now that one of the children of our lovely uh, homeland has been murdered and she was born under this system. Yeah. That, yeah. that means she was 22. Yeah. And she was possibly born in 2001. 20 something years after the revolution. Yeah. So she wasn't, she hadn't experienced the, the, anything beyond that. And she was mur murdered by the system that had controlled her. So it's sad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's also the, the way this, 
again, um, I, I think one of the reasons why it's so fucked up for me is that I try to look for some kind of logic or a consistency in this where there really uh, where there really isn't you have to kind of impose you have to kind of adopt some kind of authoritarian mindset to under to understand what what's happening which which frankly not that it's any you know um, rose-colored society here but but growing up in the west it's really hard to get my head or into that mindset and and the fact that these laws so-called you know um laws are 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 applied so inconsistent inconsistently um uh is that kind of part of the point you know that that you scare the shit out of people because they don't they don't ever really know uh, when you're going to get picked up and for what look um if you just monitor the situation around election time in iran they are so soft on hijab on scarves many girls actually you could see their hair their they don't uh, obey the dress code and the system is okay with it but then when time when time passes by things change and you see the strict manner of the police the IRGC and others besiege and it seems that to save the system they can bend a little bit bent a little bit once in a while mm -hmm. and then you go you go back to square one mm -hmm. where where you don't give anybody any permission one thing that makes me sad really because we're talking to also a number of iranian canadians mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. is look we have so many people who have double lives it seems that they're amphibians we have what, the ones who actually have lots of interest and money in Iran mm -hmm. and then do some currency exchange and come to Canada, enjoy freedom in Canada. But they also worry for their interests in Iran and they don't want the system to change. And these people are the ones I'm not just talking right now about Iranian Canadians, but also Iranians in different countries sure. that they talk to the governments to their governments to somehow support this regime in a way they want the nuclear deal to help them actually have business from their new homes hmm. with iran and the big problem is that these amphibians are the ones that are helping the system and we have so many of those amphibians in canada in north america as lobbyists as activists as whatever you can call them and they're not helping democratize Iran and they are against democracy I believe and many of them are silent today you know again when I try and look for logic in this I, I know uh, it actually frustrates people it's like enough with the trying to find logic with this with this regime it's the same question I would ask after Aban or um, David Afghari or how, how does it help you by to, to kill uh, people um, it, it you know logically it seems counterintuitive that uh, a government that uh, that a regime that is already dealing with inflation and the water crisis you know all about and and uh, dissent on all kinds of levels from uh, an, a population um, that is clearly unhappy um, it seems counterintuitive that you would then, you know, kill an innocent girl for, you know, some crazy morality rule. Um, the only way it makes sense is to believe that you should rule with it with such an iron fist that um, no one will ever dare do anything, including question your power. I mean, is that what we're supposed to conclude from this? Um, in a way, yes, but there are so many angles to this. Look, we're talking about a country that has a president who was involved in murdering thousands of political prisoners. We are talking about a system that the supreme leader um, is one of the richest people in the world because he's holding, I think, worth over $200 billion. You can check uh, Reuters story if you few years ago about the whole thing that Ayatollah Khamenei is actually overshadowing it. You have a system that many of its uh, officials 
have double lives. They're ruling the country. They're investing in the West, and many of them, unfortunately, live in British Columbia and Ontario, their families, actually. And that's a sad point. There's no Magnitsky Act working here. Mm. And it knows that it has no limits in oppressing people, but it needs a face to tell the Western societies that, oh, we are a democratic system. People go to the polls and vote. Hmm. The president is elected, not selected. And, and, and knows how to play with the minds of people in the West. And they have their own stooges, I believe, in the media, unfortunately. And when you look back and see what has happened in the last 40 years, how did how they were empowered, how they were able to oppress different parts of the society. It's unbelievable. Now, one important fact I should just mention, Mahsa Amini comes from a Kurdish background. And the Kurds have been oppressed by the system. Yep. Ethnically and also based on the religion, because many of them are not Shiites. So they are fed up. And, that, and when this innocent girl was murdered like this, I believe they're not going to stop fighting. I heard just a, a few minutes ago that four people were shot dead in the town of Divandare in Kurdistan, mm. in Iranian Kurdistan. This is not going to stop. Uh, the Kurd, uh, the Kurdish people who are the, and those who are protesting uh, in Kurdistan seem seem um, p particularly brave and fearless in terms of um, being out there uh, throwing themselves at this uh, um, in an effort to to uh, bring attention and 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 try to create change. But it is something that we're also seeing um, again. I've, uh, as I've, I was I was saying to an earlier guest um, that. The tenor and the tone and the language and the actions of the protesters um, become becomes more pointed over time. And so I can remember it wasn't that long ago that we were astounded that anybody would say death to the dictator, um, the Magbar Khamenei uh, or, you know, Magbar dictator. That's. That seems commonplace now. That seems like that's the thing you say at protests. And I mean, based on the videos we're seeing coming out of Iran. Um, t tell me what you conclude from that. Look, one thing is that they know the guy is old and too old and is ill. And one thing, another point is that they don't want a continuation of this system. That means if he dies, we're okay with, a, with an other SOB going to come and rule us or another Napoleon of the uh, animal farm. We don't want another pig ruling us. So one thing, uh, it's a message also to Mojtaba Khamenei, the son of Khamenei and all the IRGC generals that look, enough is enough. I'm not sure that this would turn into a regime change moment, but I hope it does, one. Two, you can see the cracks in the wall. You can clearly see the cracks in the wall if you're paying attention. And because Iran is in a, in a, in a bad financial and economical and environmental situation, they cannot sustain themselves. So there are two points. One, we know that they're, I believe that they're going to fall, but two, people, on this side of the border have to be ready to help those inside the country. And that's my important point. And I think that we have to reach this unity to be able to assist those inside the country and put our differences aside. That's more important. And Mahsa is the daughter of all of us, the sister of all of us. And this is the difference that I feel that this movement has from the green movement, that a part of the system 
wanted to be in power and push Khamenei out, possibly. But he was also a stooge of Ayatollah Khomeini, involved in a lot of stuff. This is different. This is the people's movement, not the political group's movement. And I hate to see some want to take advantage of this for their own ambitions and leadership, whatever you call it. What we can do is to assist people. And I think we're trying to do this. What you're doing is going to help by spreading the word. Uh, Nikahan Kosar, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time today and, and coming on this, um, this special program. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. You take care. We go to Vancouver for our next guest. Bahar Eslami is a fashion and beauty blogger, a fashion journalist, and a social media influencer. In 2018, the Islamic government of Iran shut down her page and all social media access. This is while she was in Iran, while accusing her of corrupting the minds of young Iranians. She was sentenced to up to 10 years in jail, but managed to leave Iran and reestablish her social media presence in a big way. And right now, Bahar Eslami joins me from Vancouver, Canada. Hello. Hi, Jian. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have you back on the program. Um, I know that you, like many uh, Iranians around the world and Iranian women in particular, have really been affected by this news of what happened with Masa uh, Amini. Can can you give me your personal reaction when you first heard the news that she had died? I cried. I cried and I was overwhelmed by anger. And um, I felt loneliness for all of Persian women all around the world, not only in Iran. Um, I think anger, sadness, and loneliness is the best, are the best words to describe my feelings. Tell me why the why you're using the word loneliness. Because, um, Jian, as you know, in other part of the world, girls, women, uh, it's kind of, their normality to decide what to wear, what color, what style. But us Persian women, we have to fight over the simple, the, the most simple decision of our lives. Mm. So I think that we are lonely. We, I felt lonely for myself and for other women, Iranian women. When you were crying, do you think, do you think the emotion comes from the place of being shocked that this innocent 22 year old has suddenly died for seemingly no reason? Or do you think it's because you're not shocked that, you know, that this has happened because we've seen so much of this type of thing in Iran? <sighs> Actually, it's kind of in the middle of these two feelings. On uh, one hand, I got shocked because of an innocent girl that was killed because of hijab for few hairs. 
And on the other hand, I was not shocked because this is part of Jumhuri Islam Iran and it's becoming harsher and harsher each day. And it reminds us of ISIS every day that goes by. So, you know, I was really, um, the, the reason that I was shocked because this lady, this young girl, wasn't in political riot or like she didn't do anything wrong even she was much normal mm -hmm. than other stylish girls in iran she was really simple she was wearing a long loose manteau with a like black scarf she wasn't like she didn't even have like highlights she didn't have too much makeup she was really simple. She was a tourist in her own country, came from another city to Tehran with her family. Yeah. So I think this is the most innocent, I mean, the, the highest level of innocence in Iran. I don't know that was that was really shocking and i really don't know what to say i mean this is first time that uh, it influenced every single woman not only in iran but outside mm. iran too i mean but even like harry potter's writer even like many turkish celebrities many hollywood celebrities yes. you know I don't know. This is and it seems to be growing. It seems to be growing the outcry, which is it is, and which even, is heartening to even see. Even Iranian celebrities and actresses inside Iran, they started to react. Mm. Even even though they know that the government will will like I don't know will do something with them, but they didn't keep silence. Well, I remember when we when you came on the show about a year ago, or a little bit more than that, maybe. Um, you 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 had some trepidation about whether you wanted to speak out about your own experience, but you're clearly, I mean, you're speaking out about this in social media. Um, you're here on this program now talking about it. Tell me about that decision. Jian, uh, because I felt, um, first of all, I experienced the loneliness in um, immigration of me from Iran to another country. Mm -hmm in five hours. So I feel kind of like, why? Why should I have to be far from my family, my friends, my everyone? So maybe all these experiences made me feel more responsible for my people. So I think it's the time for every single Persian women to become responsible even though they know that it might have dangers for yeah, them. Yeah, especially if they're still in Iran. Um, t tell, me, tell us about your, your own experiences. I mean, one of the things that a lot of people are saying, and, and you, you would know this, you see them in social media, a lot of Iranian women, a lot of Iranians in general, because guys are, are picked up by Gashte Arshad as well. You know, they, they, they say, this could be me. This this uh, mass I mean he could have been me. Um, tell us briefly about your own experience with uh, the so called morality police. Actually, Jian, uh, I think that every Persian girl or woman has this um, experience if they have lived in Iran. So I am not an exception to. So um, I remember then that um, it was my um, grandmother's funeral. I was. I was only like 20. So I was driving in the highway. Um, one morality police or whatever um, pulled me over and they asked me that. Um, so imagine that I was going to a funeral. So I didn't have makeup or like any like weird outfit. So they asked me that, why do you wear red nail polishes? And I was like, I didn't even notice. I'm really sad. My grandmother has passed away and I'm running to get to the funeral. And um, they took me in the van. 
they said, okay, you should come inside the van. They took me in the van. So, um, and for like two hours, they, um, t- they like drove in the highways and the like uh, avenues. And they were like talking to me that if you um, come out like this, like you will go to hell, um, you will burn in, I don't know, fire or whatever. And then after then they said, right now, are you like clear? And I was like, because I wanted to uh, run to my grandmother's funeral. Mm -hmm. I was like, Mm -hmm. yes, uh, I'm clear. Just please don't take me to Bozaro, the exact place that they took Masa Amini to that center because my mom and my dad are at funeral. So no one is here to take me out of Bozaro. So those ladies said that, okay, we will kick you out here. They kicked me out in the middle of one highway, in the middle of one highway that I didn't even know know the Mm. name of that highway. So I was like in the middle of highway, like watching everywhere that what should I do right now? By that time, there wasn't any like Uber, like online taxis or stuff. So I was just like called my friends. I was like, okay, I'm in the middle of nowhere in a highway. Just please come and save Mm. me. So and this is about this nail. Is, this is about nail polish, yeah. right? Right. Red nail polish. I mean, yeah. do do you? I, I was asking one of the other guests to say, do, do you, what what do you really think that's about? I mean, do you? I mean, surely that they don't really actually care about the color of your nail polish. So so what is the point of this? Do you believe? Uh, you know, because I think Jian uh, women are getting stronger and stronger in Iran. So um, it's funny, but I always tell all of my friends uh, here that next revolution gonna happen with women. Mm. Um, so I think that first thing for uh, government is to control over women. So if they give the right to uh, women to choose their own outfit, so women will become further and they want to have right for everything so i think this is the most important spot for jomri islami to control so if they i think that if they lose uh, authority on this uh, on this um, area they will lose their power Final question to you. I mean, it's 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 impossible to for anyone to know in terms of anything empirical. But do you feel like, or do you believe that this is a turning point somehow? Honestly, I'm kind of hopeless because um, every single day that I wake up, I check all the news um, channels to see if like Iran gets free. Um, and I fly back to my country, but every single day I'm like, okay, no hope, no change. Honestly, I'm hopeless, but I think that this is going to be uh, one of the most important um, points from 88 um, uh, riot. The Green Movement? Till yeah. now. Yeah. From 2009 till now. Yeah. Yes. Um, Bahar, thank you for making the time and uh, always love having you on the program. I appreciate this. Thank you, Jian, for uh, giving voice to us to talk and let other people in the world um, hear that what is going on for Iranian women. Thanks a lot. Merci. Bye bye.
Look around Choose your own ground How you live All right Dore Khatibi Hill is a media and creative arts lecturer at Leeds College in England. She is a PhD candidate and researcher in the field of women's studies and media. She's been living in the UK for almost 20 years. Her background is in documentary filmmaking and editing. She is currently working on the effects of social media on changing women's local identity. And right now, Dore Khatibi Hill joins me from Yorkshire in the UK. Hello. Hi, are you okay? Thank you so much for doing this. No, thanks for having me in uh, in your podcast. Uh, I have been listening to quite a few of them, and you're doing a great job. So, so thank you for doing what you're doing. That's kind of you. T- tell tell me. I, I wish we you, we had you on the show under better circumstances. Tell me how you've been. I know. How you've been processing the news about Massa Amini over the last few days. Mm. I've been processing it. I spent a whole day, not yesterday because it was two days ago, wasn't it? Uh, I remember I spent the whole day uh, crying my eyes out. And uh, actually, I'll tell you what happened. I was uh, when I when I uh, read the news uh, on Instagram, and obviously whilst uh, Massa was still alive, and you know we were just like posting. Um, pictures and saying that you know she's in a critical condition and then suddenly she she passed away and then that day i was in the car going to the gym with my husband um and to that point i think it was in the afternoon and my husband was actually quite tired of me just being constant on my phone and obviously for my health as well because he was saying that you so sort of like indulge yourself in this, that like you're in a black hole, you, you, it seems like you can't come out of it. And why are you on your phone all the time? Just give yourself a break. And then um, I kid you not, I uh, I had a mental breakdown in the car uh, and I started not shouting, I started screaming at my husband, uh, crying and saying, you don't know how, what this is and mm. what this means to me. Uh, and then he was shocked because, he was, you know, he was thinking like, you know, why my wife is just all of a sudden she starts screaming. And I was like, you just don't have a clue what's going on. Because obviously what this talk was like, you know, everything about your own, uh, you know, like childhood and everything that when you were young happened to you in Iran. Right. Um, you know, as if like I always brushed it on the carpet and all of a sudden I'm actually thinking, actually, hang on a minute, like, you know, what's been happening? And this this has happened to me. This has happened to my friends. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was awful. Uh, and then I'm crying hi- historically. It's, it's interesting because you... I'm, uh, I mean, I, your experience sounds like a microcosm of what's happening for the global community, Iranian community in general, and and it and it leads me to be able to ask you from a, from a personal standpoint why you believe this event. I mean, it's not new, certainly for people in Iran, young people, women to be detained. It's not even new for them to die in de- detention. Un- unfortunately, mm-hmm. it's a horrendous situation as we know in Iran. Why do you think this event is creating? Um, is is creating such an outcry and is such a um, a, a touchstone for the way uh, it's affecting people like yourself. Hmm. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, obviously, as you said at the beginning, that's uh, this is the, it, my area of study, women's study. So I've uh, I've spent a lot of time reading about the history of women's movement in Iran. And as you know, the since the constitutional revolution in Iran, which was back in 1905, between 1905 to 1911, women been fighting for their, uh, you know, for emancipation and, you know, to, to gain their rights. But every time women want, you know, came out, um, whether it was for bread shortage, whether it was for um, uh, Islamic revolution, every time they came out, yes, it was for them as well, but it was like, you know, supporting a cause. Uh, but it's like, I, I feel like, well, apart from 
uh, when they came out on 8th of March, and that's 1979. And, you know, when they were protesting about saying that they don't want the compulsory hijab, so maybe that one and this, and then we had one million signature campaign, which was, you know, although it was a very good start, you know, they never really got what they wanted. So I feel like this is this is the first time that women are, are leading this movement. So it's not for any other cause but women. Um, so they are leading this movement and men are behind them. What I found uh, really moving and I think it's really powerful. I don't know if you've seen the videos. I've, I've been watching some videos that uh, they've been saying, they've been chanting, I'd kill the one who killed my sister. Mm. And this is really important because if you go back in time, every single revolution that we had or every single movement that we had that, you know, people have been coming out and, you know, the government's been, been sort of like shooting people and arresting them or whatnot. People have been saying, I'd kill the one who killed my brother. Me kosham, me kosham, mm. onke baro daram kosh. And this is the significance of this one. It's changed. It's changed to me kosham, me kosham, haram ke haram kosh. And, and you see that, like, not only women, men actually setting women's scarves on fire. So, you know, as if, like, they, un they finally understood mm -hmm. this is not just a women's fight. This is our fight. You know, if, if they don't gain, um, you know, um, egalitarian, you know, if they don't get these, you know, um, equal rights, it means like we can't we can't move forward either so right. they finally as if you know like a light bulb gone off actually this is our fight i, I mean the morality police as we all know affects men as well it's a uh, it's disproportionately the way women are affected but it's it's uh, men get rounded up and 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 this this type of thing happens i mean let, let me ask you because you're mm. you have such a perspective um what do you think of of the authorities saying uh, you know, we we think this is unfortunate, and she had a heart attack. No, hundred percent not, hundred percent not. Because, but first of all, there's a picture of uh, Massa or Gina uh, that there's blood coming out of her ear. Uh, there are. Um, black circles under her eye i actually saw a letter today that comes out uh, that actually a letter came out this doctor that said he is it was actually not a heart attack there were girls in that van who uh, i heard uh, um, masses uh, dad's uh, voice that uh, was uh, being interviewed by this journalist to say the girls told me that um, she was beaten up mm -hmm. uh, so there, there is evidence that it's not a heart attack the video was like you know my my job is media your job is media like you know you watch that video and you know it's yep. it's edited um it's 100 percent not no my, my, my question actually wasn't i mean it, yeah and the father has said she didn't have any history of heart trouble i mean who i, I don't know how many 22 year olds who are fit die of a heart attack anyway mm -hmm. but but my question was more what do you think of the government saying that i mean what does what what does that tell you what it's a cover-up story isn't it they always have a cover-up story isn't it because it's not our fault you know we didn't do anything i mean even let's go with that story let's go with that story okay she had a heart attack which she didn't even if she had a heart attack you caused that you know you put that girl in that situation i would have a heart attack if i you know see it wasn't heart attack i'm just i just want to really right. Right. Um, yeah. you know emphasize on that that it wasn't yeah. Yeah. but you know you put that girl in that situation obviously that happened but that's a cover-up story um it's another you know um ukraine in like plain story you know that they they got a cover-up story for why do you think i mean you study media um mm. and and you study women's issues and you you know the situation in iran when it gets to this level, I mean, it's tough to say that we've we've we're, we've seen so many atrocities, uh, people being shot in the streets, uh, a plane being shot down. It's it's you know uh, we've seen a lot of death, to be honest. But mm -hmm. but why do you think at this stage that we're still not seeing much attention to this from international media? I see a lot in Persian, mm -hmm. you know, Twitter and uh, Iranians in the diaspora on their Instagram. But in terms of international media, a BBC story here one on the guardian maybe mm. one thing on cnn why isn't there more 
Uh, I actually disagree with you. I think we have. You know, if you compare it to other things that happened, like recently, Mass's uh, hashtag uh, reached 2 million, which is the second after uh, say no to execution. Mm. Uh, so I think he has gone, he's, you know, it's become quite big on social media. Uh, but I think there is still room for it, absolutely, 100%. Uh, but like The Guardian's written about it, the BBC, I've seen German TV channels, you know, I'm not big on them, so I don't know what they right, are. Right. Uh, but I've, you know, what's actually um, really important about this one is that the individual has been talking about it, you know, like JK. Um, JK Rowling, yeah, yeah. Jake are on. Uh, there were there were like a I think couple of Turkish um, authors, um, Sharon Stone. Um, yep, yep. You know, so so you see like the big characters. I was actually speaking to one of um, one of the activists that uh, today, and I said, "What what else can we do? You know, let's let's do something like, for example, I, I I'd like to email uh, university sees, you know, like reach out to them, see what more we can do." But like, uh, yes, there's 100% we can do more. But then again, you know, it gets lost, isn't it? It gets r- lost with, with everything else. I mean, look at Afghanistan, you know, the girls are still don't go to school. Yeah. But then that that's why people say hashtags are not, you know, it's, it's a waste of time yeah, yeah, or like, you yeah. know, come on, let's go on the street. But I disagree with that. The hashtag is what we can uh, you know, bring the attention to, to, to these things. So please, whoever listens to this, please use the hashtags and use them correctly uh, because we need to get more attention. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I don't, one doesn't want to compare these things in, in some sort of, uh, you know, Olympics of oppression or something. But, um, mm. you know, we, we, it would be nice if Massa's name became a worldwide household name the way George Floyd's name did, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, you want that, and, and we're, not, we're not anywhere near that yet, you know, in terms yeah. of... You, you know, there is one more thing. In, in Twitter, uh, most Iranian write in Farsi. You know, yes. maybe we need to encourage people to yes. write more in English. And I think everything, like in Instagram, it's all in Farsi. Like today, for example, I, I, uh, I called on all the women activists, you know? Mm. Uh, so we need to we need to we need to yeah. keep doing it absolutely uh, and it's not just I mean mm. uh, um, that, that's part of the reason why we're doing this program uh, we, mm. we're in English and and uh, it, frankly it's not even just non-Iranians there are second and third generation mm-hmm. Iranians that don't don't do their business and don't don't you know follow things in in, in Persian language uh, mm. that, that um, you, we can become much, much more accessible to in English absolutely um, let me ask you a final question and I again I thank mm-hmm. you so much for doing this do do you do you think um i i warned against this at the beginning of the show that i i i i'm you know a bit gun shy to sort of say well you know every time there's there's protests and we have we we see a lot of anger and we see the people rising up we we hope that it'll be some sort of tipping point or turning point or inflection Mm -hmm. point um and it, it 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 never you know it doesn't necessarily turn out to be do do you see this as some some sort of turning point you know i think what what we, what we do wrong i mean not not me personally because i'm not there uh what maybe people are doing wrong or these leaders whoever is leading these movements this one's is leaderless really um people who are in power i think give people false hope you know they're not setting people a, a milestone. Do you know what I mean? It's like every time there is a problem, we're not actually aiming to solve that issue. They, like people just straight away want to change the regime. Okay, and that I don't know. I'm not an I'm not an expert in politics. Uh, I can just you know say from my personal experience that. You, you know, it might happen tomorrow, I don't know, but I don't think you can always aim that, you know, that big. Mm. But maybe if we aim, like, you know, smaller, then we could achieve bigger things. Uh, but whether this is going to be a turning point or not, I, all I know that is uh, something big happened because in a, in a place like Sakres, like San Andaj, uh, as we know, like, you know, men are very, like, they write in, you know, like, uh, but then men actually came out with women. Yeah. Uh, they said, actually, you know, they, they don't want the scarves. So I think what this changed was the uh, men's perception 
uh, towards that stuff, you know, which I, which I said today on my Instagram as well, it's not just a scarf, you know, it's not just a piece of cloth over your head. It's the, um, it's the thinking behind that scarf, hijab, you know, if, if anything, if nothing else happens, that is going to change, you know, a lot of, and that is because a lot of men come out uh, and, um, you know, like sort of like being, uh, shoulder by shoulder by, by by women. I saw a video today. This girl, like a man, was just walking on the sidewalk, and then I actually just wanted to go and give her a hug. She shouted at me. She was like, "Oh, be your vasat!" And then you know, like, "Come on, come on, come in the middle. You know, come walk with us." And then and then he came. You know, he came like you know, like very sheepishly. You know, it's usually like women, like we've seen in the past, like, you know, sheepishly follow. Like he came as if like, you know, he was scared. Like you could see, like you could see things like his body language. And, and then another man like sort of joined the, uh, this rally. And, you know, you know, things like that is it, powerful. I think if anything, it made women believe in themselves, you know, that there, there is hope. Uh, and I hope it's a turning point. Dore Khatibi Hill, I really appreciate the time today and, and your perspective. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. This dream I'm dreaming Won't you wake me up tonight Cause this life Strange dream I'm dreaming If anyone don't feel right Never thought you would leave me I never thought I'd love to start again Somebody All right. Our final guest for this Rook special is a singer and Sufi dancer who moved to Canada from Iran just a few months ago. Sabo Zomeni studied traditional singing and music at the Conservatory of Music in Tehran and majored in philosophy at the Azad University of Tehran. Saba released an album named John in 2018. And right now, Sabo Zomeni joins me from Toronto. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for coming on the program. I'm, I'm sorry that it's under uh, sad and difficult circumstances, but we, we appreciate you doing this. Me too. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Saba, let me just start by asking what, what your reaction was when you heard that this 22-year-old woman, Masa Amini, in, uh, in Iran had been um, detained and then had died uh, last Friday. So obviously, I should say that was so moving, that was so heartbreaking, and it, it reminds me all that happening uh, to me before, and uh, that was so ugly face of Iran, which none of us want to see, even if we are out of Iran, we don't want to hear about these kind of things, and it's going to worse and worse and worse and worse every day all day and this is it it's so bad it's so shocking especially for someone who hasn't lived in iran for in recent years uh like myself to and, and for a lot of people just to hear this story and and it's just so horrendous that these kind of things are happening can i can i ask you though as someone who just came from there um, are, are you surprised? I mean, these detentions don't always end up in death, but did you react in shock or did you react in, in a sad resignation that, you, you know, you, these, these kind of things are inevitable? Uh, I should say, um, even if you leave there and see with your eyes and hear with your own ears every day about this kind of happens um still is shocking still is it's so it's so unbelievable 
But for me, um, instead of shocking, um, that, that was so disappointing. Again, like like you you disappointed about about a thing about the particular thing over and over and still shock you, make you make you move, make make you make you feel sad over and over and more and more and it was still shocking. Never never you can use to it. Yeah. This kind of that happens to your people, to you. And yeah. You you said something um, a moment ago where you said uh, that it reminded me of things that have happened to me. I mean, one of the things that a lot of folks have been saying, Iranians, both in Iran and around the world, especially Iranian women, have been saying, "This could have been any of us. This could be me. You know, this could be." Um, tell tell me about that feeling and what you've experienced in your in your own life. Um. As you know, as and as you mentioned, I'm a singer and uh, a dancer, um, and being a woman by itself is an illegal thing in in Islamic Republic of Iran. And if you if you add something, add some spices in your life as as an art, mm. it goes worse. And um, um yeah um I, I was so active in in music in iran uh, i had my own gig uh we we played some uh gypsy jazz which is it, it's a genre of 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 uh music uh, for those who don't know about it and um i was so passionate about it uh, I, I was so happy I could influence um, f on, uh, you know, the girl who can see me, who can listen to my mm. voice. And I feel powerful. I feel uh, different. And uh, I was just want to keep going and as a strong woman and be their voice who can't uh be brave to do that and um which is i know it's so hard and it's so risky uh but i kept going uh, w in one of our performances uh in iran in one of the cafe uh suddenly some of the police uh, morality of police uh they came in a cafe all of a sudden and they stopped the show uh, and they uh, ask ask the owners who's the Saba we want to see the see Saba she's singing here and we want her and and I should I should explain that singing yeah. for women singing lead in a concert especially to a co uh, co um, a, a mixed audience is uh, is not allowed right is 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 illegal yes and was the cafe women only or was it a a mixed audience a mixed audience okay. and um, that was kind of private show but um, but it, it still count public area right. and uh, fortunately my my parents were there but they couldn't do anything about it and my my gig too my my friends too they they arrested me and they said we just want to ask some couple of questions and then you can go home and i i knew that moment it was a it was a huge lie and I saw the van. They put me in there, and we we go to Wozaro, which is a par parliament. It's a, it's a police uh, moral morality police Iran, and uh, yeah, we went there. And after that, they um, they got me and they brought me to jail. Did they uh, tell you why they were taking you to jail? They they told me you were singing in a public and uh, you were dancing in the middle of your your singing mm -hmm. and uh, the the people their audience in there was was uh, 
was without hijab and uh it's all your fault and what 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 are you thinking about right. what are you thinking about it, it, it's it's iran you can't do that and you should go to the jail for one year at least one year and they 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 lied about it i know but um that was so scary that moment mm -hmm. my parents was out of the um that place and my mother was under stress my father's too uh and everything goes complicated and we didn't notice it, it, even notice they were going to have me in jail mm -hmm. for that for just singing right. you know right. things go serious i've been in a jail of, uh, for four days and uh, my parents brought vasire for that uh and brought me out bail, and after bail, that bail. Uh, yeah yeah mm -hmm. bail. and after that um uh, I had a couple of courts about this, mm -hmm. about 19 months. And after 19 months, we, we, we were so hopeful uh, about that it's going to be finished soon, but uh, it, it, it wasn't. Uh, the court decided to uh, take me to jail again for three months and one day. Uh, this one day has a has a reason behind this. If you um, have one day more after after your your hook me and I don't know what, what can I explain that. Um, which means you can you can't buy it, mm. uh, and you can do anything about it. And um, yeah, um, I go to the jail again. And uh, my parents had been shocked again. And this is all mother, this is all from just singing in a cafe, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm so sorry that happened to you, and it is so insane and and horrendous to hear these stories. And at the same time, what what, what do you make of the fact that someone like Masa Amini? Um, I mean, she was literally, apparently, doing nothing, you know? I mean, she was a, a tourist in Tehran. Uh, how do you get your head around that? Uh, when I saw th that news about Massa, um, I just imagined myself that in that situation again. It's like a movie in, in front of my eyes, mm. and I, I thought about their, her family, uh, about everything. Uh, al although these kind of happens every day, all day in Iran, but um, that was like a like a trigger uh, mm. again, and it's like you know ev every th this kind of happens mm. it happens every day, but uh, it's like you 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 got injured with a needle every day, but suddenly a shotgun shoot you and every everything start again and you you get angry again and you you can realize oh my god this is happen for, happening every day to me right, and right. i can't be silent i can be do not i can do nothing about it and massa is a new thing um again to us and it's so moving it's so heartbreaking but, why do you think? Why do you think? Given that this isn't, um, sadly, this isn't something particularly new in Iran. Uh, you're you're an example of this uh, in recent years, yourself having to go to jail, etc. Why do you think this? And and there are people who die in detention, uh, have in the past. Why do you think this uh, event has created the outcry it has? And do you believe? Do you think that this represents some kind of turning point? I hope so. I don't know because um, they so dangerous to, for us. They 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 can do anything you can you even can imagine about. And uh, people go for protests, and people people are brave, but they tired. They tired about 
all these kind of happenings and uh, um, I hope so I can see the anger in people and they, they can't tolerate anymore and uh, this maybe Mahsa is a trigger for for you know um, uh, for people can can stand up again can mm. can go on the street and and mm, say something they they can't imagine um, they can they can say these kind of things uh, because they are dangerous for each of them and uh but they they angry I, I think it can be something it can it can meaning something you you came from iran just seven months ago uh do you yeah. think if you were in tehran right now you would be joining those protests i mean they're incredibly yeah. brave the people who are out there protesting i i think that i i, I should i should do that yeah i should have do that uh, and i i did I did that before, and although my parents was um, um, they they don't want me to do that. Sure. But yeah. I think it, it's our responsibility to do that to to something changed, you know. Uh, and yeah, I, I think I sh- I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I, I would do that. Saba, I guess you're an example of of someone who, you know, they tried to scare the shit out of you to get you to, to stop doing what you love and to, to stop speaking your truth, but they, it didn't work, did it? You're, you're, you're not going to stop. No, I, I, I sang when I was in jail for the women are there and I make them dance, I make them cry and uh, I, I was thinking, this is me. They can't stop my mind. They can't stop my voice. They can't stop my body to not doing that that out of here. But I'm still doing that. I'm I'm still singing in 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 jail. And uh, I learn uh, singing to some of them. I'm I'm we yeah we uh, I I found a couple of friends there and. I see they how they str- struggle with their problems, and that was so sad. And no, they can't. They can't stop none of us from our passions. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you so much for telling us your story, and thank you so much for doing it in English. It's really appreciated. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Saba Zameni, singer and Sufi dancer. Uh, she put out an album in 2018 called John. She's a really interesting artist. Uh, if you haven't checked her out already, do so on Instagram and elsewhere. You can find her doing her thing. Um, microphones are back on for Groovy Shia and Smart Pega. Um, all right. Yeah. What What can I say? I mean, um, they all said all the things, but um, I I think that. Being unified is the key. To well, you said I was thinking about that right? so you, uh, just now. Actually, you would my thought after digesting these seven or eight guests that we've just been through around the world yeah. is what you said earlier at the beginning of the show. You were yeah. talking about how you feel there's a sense of unity. Yes, yes. Um, I, I don't know if we if we go to a rally in uh, you know uh, at some point whether the 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 two day and the, the this faction and that faction are not going to start yelling at each other again but but um but certainly through the spine through this program was uh, there's not a lot of debate about whether no. people feel outrage yeah and I think actually the role of women in like in this time I think it it bring it it's one of the keys to those to this unifying people. I can't remember who, who I was just gonna say Dora uh, mentioned something uh-huh. like that too and I and when she was speaking that that really hit home for me when she was saying you know um, this is led by the women and mm. the men are supporting it yeah. whereas it's sometimes or oftentimes been the other the way slogan. around and she the was slogans, talking about slogans exactly. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, what was I gonna say though I also found um, oh I thought you know, in terms of whether this is a tipping point or a turning point, mm-hmm. I don't know who it was. Maybe it was also Dora or maybe it was Moral who said, you know, 
there's these little there's these little touchstone points mm -hmm. that happen that keep that keep amping up the opposition or the anger and so there's Aubon and there's flight 752 mm -hmm. and yeah. there's you know I think uh, Mandana said was that. it Mandana yeah, yeah. And now it's and like now this is another one like we're not gonna forget there's yeah. Neda in, yes. in, in 2009 we're not gonna hopefully forget the name and and again not that we not that there haven't been thousands of other uh, yes. um, people who've died and 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 you know who've uh, been suppressed and oppressed by this regime, but um, yeah. All right, okay. uh, I don't. I, we'll see what happens in the next few days, uh, but um, yeah. but uh, for now, we'll expect to get back to our regular um, Rook programming next week, and some of the folks that we postponed from today's show will. Uh, We'll have them on next week. Um, thank you to all of the guests uh, who did this. Thank you to Yushai and Bega. And uh, this is full time for this Rook Special Edition today. Our website, rookmedia.com, is where that you can you can find clips from this episode. You can find all of our guests and video, funnies, everything there. Uh, everything you need to know about our show is at rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together and who worked extra hard on getting this special done. Uh, Savvy Roham, talented Anahita, Super Paris, a smart Pega, Alay Merton, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. If you don't already subscribe, please press that subscribe button on whatever platform you're on or subscribe on all of our platforms. You can do that as well so that you make sure you don't miss an episode you can find me on instagram at gian gomeshi and as ever mizu bashi <laughs>